Hey guys, welcome to Marketing Cheat Guys. Thanks for joining us today. Today I have on the show Chris Penny, a local Canadian who is focused down on a niche. He runs ChrisPenny101.com, focusing on marketing to lawn care professionals. He's been kind enough to join us here on the show. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Sam. It's exciting. This is my first my first video interview. I'm no longer hiding behind the woods. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, you came out. It's uh, it's good to have you on for sure. So, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and how you got into the marketing business, specifically into the lawn care marketing business? Okay. Well, it's a super long, convoluted story, starting with the neighbors asking me to mow their lawns when I was 14. Um, <laughs> that turned into a fully maxed out uh, route to be able to handle with school at the same time in the in the shoulder seasons in the spring and the fall. Yep. Um, so from there, I was trying to figure out how to scale, and so that kind of I, I didn't want to hire employees because I knew I didn't know what I was doing, and. Uh, <laughs> I knew that some some middle-aged uh, labor staff probably wouldn't respect me at all if I wanted to, to manage them. So instead, what I did is I sold franchises to my friends in university. Nice. So basically, I just said, here's everything I figured out so far. I uh, they had no upfront fee. I just gave them the equipment for free. And then I kept a percentage of their sales. So it was like, if they didn't make any money, I didn't make any money. I, I lost money. Um, and that worked really well. It was like pretty crazy uh, summer business. And that's probably where I first started being concerned with digital marketing uh, because I was starting up these franchises and they had to go from like zero to busy in a couple months in the spring. So I could kind of seed off some of the route from an existing franchisee to kind of give them some work to get started. Sure. And then, um, but otherwise it, we were mostly doing door to door sales at the time. So it was learning to deal with rejection and uh, it, it's the best way to learn what your clients are thinking, really. I mean, getting the door slammed in your face a million times, yeah. like it, it, it's a good way to get started. And then for me though, like, best way to learn is to teach so being forced to teach these uh, well not forced but being in a position where I was uh, it was my job to teach these students that were my friends other university students how to sell door-to-door -door, uh, that that was pretty powerful and so that was right about when um, I think it's probably about 10 years ago that would be and so around then our clients were just starting to have email addresses overall uh, a lot of our clientele in lawn care is elderly, uh, elderly people, so so they're offended almost if you ask them if they had an email address back then. <laughs> so it was it wasn't easy, but we we were starting the digital then. That was really supplementing our uh, the flyer drops that we were doing because we had to get these lawns fast to get these guys going. Sure. But um, so that evolved. Uh, eventually, it was a really good summer job, but it wasn't the best. It wasn't a career. Uh, I mean, like it's great to make ten grand in the summer if you're a student, but you can't live off of that. And okay. I, I decided at the beginning not to get into snow, so I needed to find a way to go from being from offering ultra cheap service because that that was our stick. We were students. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you can trust. Well, you can trust us, but like we might we might make mistakes, but we're the cheapest price in town, so deal with it. Sure. Uh, and it, and it helped. It, I mean, it totally got us going. But I, eventually, I wanted more than that. I didn't. I wanted to. Well, I wanted better margins because yep. if if anything went wrong, it would just kill our profits for a long time. So I I, I eventually transitioned. To uh, away from the students and towards a managerial model. Okay. And basically, what we did was we reduced all of our drive time, which is a huge expense in lawn in, in the lawn care world. Uh, took our most densely populated part of the route, doubled our pricing, and then um, and, and doubled the service value. So I was looking at what are all the things I can add to the service that cost me next to nothing that enhance the experience that, that would justify doubling my pricing. So kind of ambitious and that's kind of how I handle this business because I was, I, I, I always thought of it as kind of my kid business. I was like 20 years old at the time living at my parents' house, had hardly any expenses. So if I screwed up, like life goes on. Sure. Um, and, and I figured that was one the opportunity in my life where I could get away with that. So I kind of held myself responsible for failing fast in, in this part of the business. So 
doubled the pricing, dropped the, the clients that weren't profitable, and then held my breath to see whether anybody would sign up or not that spring. And it worked. Uh, it worked really well. And that was, uh, you were mentioning wanting to talk about niching down and, uh, or the American niching down. Um, I think that was probably my first kind of experience with that concept because I realized we went from, well, when I changed the marketing message from being cheap to expensive, yep. I thought what would happen was my closing rate would just drop and I would only close the expensive ones. But really what happened was all of a sudden all these guys that were seeking expensive work came out of the woodwork and the business was so much easier to run. I mean, we were we, like, we, we went from like four or 500 lawns a week down to... 150 lawns a week and we were making the same profit kind of thing. Sure. So with clients that don't complain all the time on pre-authorized credit card, like it was just, <laughs> it was, it, it, that, that really woke me up to the, to the power here. And, um, so from there, uh, I learned a lot about, a lot about the digital marketing, at, but specifically how to target the marketing to attract specific people, but also, try and um, repel other people because nice. I mean I, I I was answering the phones a lot of the time or I had um, a kind of assistance helping me answer the phone but it's it was expensive so I really didn't want all these leads for tire kickers or for people who weren't going to convert so that was where I realized if we crafted the message a certain way and we put certain messages into it things kind of like the pre-authorized credit card that scares people away who are looking for cheap pricing um, things like better design on the website um, putting a little bit more money into video and things like this to differentiate us from the from the competitors um, having a stronger guarantee um, the, um, what, what else did we do but but also focusing on the experience I guess so a lot of companies will just blow off the mess that they make. We'll take the extra five minutes and blow off all the surfaces kind of thing. It's just little tweaks like this that that people notice, I guess. And so I'm trying to think of where I extrapolate from there to the mowing or to the to the marketing that I'm doing now. I guess, so, um, so when you made that transition from you were running it as a student business, you were going upscale, did you continue to have your – your buddy is running franchise model for you? Or did you take it back and go from 450 divided by five, six guys to 150 run by you and employees? Yeah, no, the, the second option there. So okay. um, uh, because it was student-based, that also meant that as they graduated, uh, they, they couldn't really keep going, which sure. it sure. sucked. Like a lot of them had built up roots and relationships with clients, but the whole model was based on around it being students. So we couldn't really justifiably we pushed a few of them a little bit beyond being students <laughs> yeah. uh but i but i i didn't want them to make this their lives uh it was meant to be a summer job it wasn't enough money to live off of and the margins in the snow it was a, the snow was a whole different business so i never got into into the snow really right um so so yeah eventually they graduated and moved on to uh to grown-up jobs <laughs> and uh and, and that was around the time where and, and we actually we really struggled finding franchisees so that was part of the, that was an issue with the model as well um i think it was too good to be true kind of and uh especially if you compare with um some of the other student franchises i ran uh, college bro Oh, right on. Cool. So, yeah, I had uh, I had friends that did them all, and I was kind of their secret guy to help them out. But in the in return, I was learning how their models worked, to, so I could copy it for mine. Okay. Um, and um, we we did struggle finding franchisees. We spent our whole winter doing it, and we we, we found some good ones, um, but it still was frustrating that even if we did find a good one, we'd have them for a year or two maybe three years and then they're done university and then we had to find new ones so right. that's where I switched to the manager model and it was the exact same problem again that actually had me selling the company uh, a few years later because because I decided not to do snow it meant that I didn't have year-round employment which right. meant that I was drafting guys who are happy to be collecting EI through the winter or uh, um, employment insurance yep um, and a lot of these guys were awesome workers, but I think that their passion was more the winter months than it than the summer months. The summer was done so they could get have their uh, have their free time in the winter. But snowboarding, so skiing, sure. 
So yeah, but it, but it, but their passion wasn't the job, and it right. meant that I was working all day long with these people who they weren't there because they loved to be there. Sure. Um, and so I mean, we we subcontracted a bunch of snow for some for some winters, but it snow is twenty four seven, and you're on call, and it's a high liability. Yep. And lawns are a lot more forgiving and that, that was a lot of the reason why I got into the lawns right, that what attracted me was the ability to do it on my own schedule it's more sure. or less sure um, so so eventually um, actually it, it, it I really enjoyed this the growth and the speed that I could ch make changes in the company yeah uh, over the years and I felt as if I had kind of backed myself into a corner eventually where, geez, I've been 15 years building this business and it was never a big business. And I, um, I, was, uh, I was a part of a group called Service Autopilot, uh, Service Autopilot Academy. And so this is a, a group limited to 100 lawn care business owners through North America. I think, I, was, I think it's 500 US a month to be a part of it. Yep. Um, which meant that the caliber of guys in it were awesome. And so after about a year of, of learning from these guys, I realized that my company was always going to grow half as quickly as the guys that were operating year round. Sure. Um, and that, I, I don't know, I got really depressed. Uh, I, I, because I had this sense that because I had put all my, my time and energy towards lawn care and that now lawn care isn't what I, or this company, I don't know. I, I had really attached my, my self-worth and who I was to this, to this endeavor. And so just the fact that it was making me so miserable eventually, and it just wasn't, it wasn't getting the traction that I wanted, despite the endless time I would put into it, I got really depressed. And so um, eventually I sold the company, um, not even to, for pro like, I, I made money on it, but I sold it to not even the highest bidder. I, I was more concerned with um, passing it on to somebody who would be able to continue looking after these clientele that I had built such long-term relationships with. Nice. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't in the state of mind to be uh, to be um, as profitable as I could have been. I don't think. Sure. Um, it was kind of a nasty period of my life, and that that's where. Uh, um, so I sold it, had enough money to live for a few years um, off of it while I figured out what I was going to do next. Yeah. Um, started daily ritual of uh, ice baths and, and cold showers um, as an alternative to taking antidepressants. Okay. Uh, Tim Ferriss is one of my heroes, and he's been talking. He talks a lot about that. Um, and so I decided, okay, if I. Um, man, I don't want to get too dark, but I, my, my my decision was if I. If the cold showers don't stop the suicidal thoughts, I'll take the antidepressants. Okay. Um, and I did it a year and never took them. <laughs> so I so it worked. Have to... You're endorsing cold showers. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. No, like I, 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 I could write a whole paper on the benefits of it, and I don't think we really understand the science fully, but um, it's powerful. I guess it was just a, it was just a matter of like knowing that I was able to make myself do something that was that uncomfortable. And knowing that probably the rest of the day, there's no way any, like, no matter how dark my mind gets, it's probably not going to be that uncomfortable. Okay. And so it, it put me into a position of power over my, over this, over these sensations, as opposed to, I, I'm now in control of the worst part of my life, you know, as opposed to it controlling me. Okay. Which, for me, depression is very closely related to control. Um, so, and, and, and that traction I was mentioning before. So... I, uh, How did you make the jump then? So you, you went through that period a couple of years. What brought you uh, yeah. into digital marketing? So um, I, uh, I knew a lot about the marketing because I had to survive off of it for so long. Okay. Um, and I worked for a marketing company in Ottawa. And um, I won't say what they're called, but <laughs> I didn't have much confidence in what I had learned or what I had taught myself. Okay. Uh, but after working for them, I had a lot. <laughs> um, the the like the value they were providing for the pricing that they were charging, it was like it just really opened my eyes. Okay, I can actually seriously compete with these guys because the results that I've created for myself for the for the effort that I have to put in relative to what these guys are doing, like wow. So I lasted with them for a month, 
before going out on my own and offering marketing to people around Ottawa. And um, I, I was kind of selling to my personal network and I, I, it worked, but I learned pretty quickly after the first few clients that I had that the results I could provide for them weren't, it, I, I wasn't in to, as in tune at all as what I was for the lawns. Sure. So that's where I thought, okay, let's try, let's try, let's try and focus on the lawns again and see how this compares. And you, I can't, you'll never go back. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so from there, I started a Facebook group. Um, it, uh, it was called Lawn. Well, it is called Lawn Authorities, and um, it's targeted specifically at at lawn care professionals who are looking to build an authoritative business. And so. I combined the knowledge of my niche along with the knowledge of what I learned from the lawn care business as to what, as to like, what is a, I mean, it's all, it's product creation at the end of the day. That's something I've been thinking about for, since for years, I guess now is what is the perfect product to sell? Um, and in the end, it's about experience. And, and I've learned people don't remember what you did for them. They remember how you made them feel. Um, and so it's so, it's, 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 it's so, uh, uh, what do they call it? Woo, woo science or something like that. But like, it's just, it's about, it's about love really. It's about caring. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I, I, I said, okay, I'm not going to sell myself. I'm just going to help people okay. That's all I'm gonna do. and I'm going to help people specifically where I know that I can leverage my knowledge to help them the most. So rather than trying to help everybody, who in the world can I help the most? And that, that came back to the lawn care guys again. Um, who in the world, where have I experienced the most pain that I can help people avoid? You know, <laughs> these, these kind of thoughts. So that, that's what I did. I just set myself to, I figured if it, it was just like the doubling the price thing. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to commit to it. And if it doesn't work, then I'll give up and I'll do something different. But I'm going to commit to it before, I, I'm going to fail fast. So I started the group and then just started sharing random things that I thought might be helpful, might be interesting, um, and without selling myself. And um, it's, it's kind of crazy how well it works, it, like how well it's resonated. Um, Would you say that your understanding of their fears, frustrations, aspirations, wants has played a big role in you being able to attract those people to you because you know what is keeping them up at night, what's frustrating them? what those pain points are? Yeah, well, it's, it's more than attracting them. Attract, like the, I find inbound marketing, if you do it right, they kind of attract themselves or they'll like word of mouth. Or you can, I, ha, I, I use social automation and, and some ideas like this. I, I managed to get a lot of Instagram followers really quickly. Um, and then I, I kind of built funnels to drive that traffic back towards the group. So I, I used some marketing tricks to make it work. Sure. But, the, but the magic was getting them to uh, trust me, getting them to, to, to care about me, I guess. Like it's knowing that I care about them is, is what I've been trying to give away or trying to show them. So I and, find and how do you do that? Just, I mean, for, for our audience, yeah. I, I'm curious as to how you show them that authenticity. I mean, obviously you do care and that's part of the magic stuff, but being able to convey that to other people via digital platforms, right. what are some of the things that you've done that seem to resonate with your audience? I think it's partly what I have done, but almost equally what I haven't done. And okay. so I, I've, I've yet to, to sell myself. I've mentioned that I have but like one, I've, I posted like twice kind of thing so far saying that uh, I have availability for work to do. Um, for I, I put in the description of my group uh, a link to my website right at the very bottom of it, kind of mentioning what I do, but that's about it. Okay. Um, so I think by, by having zero kind of desperation, um, no, ask, no push to set to sell, but and then giving lots of information and and yeah, focusing on what I know are fears and concerns that they have. But more, it's just fears and concerns that I have. So rather than thinking about it for them, it's like uh, Tim Ferriss's idea of scratch your own itch. Mm -hmm. So it's like if there's something that's keeping me up at night, and I and I but I and I know that 
I know I feel as if I have a good grip on like what I should be doing to to fix it. I'll kind of share these kinds of ideas. Um, okay. Or if I see uh, a lot of it comes from current clients, actually. So rather than it's a little bit awkward sometimes to say, "Hey, the way you're running your business isn't ideal." So instead, what I'll do is I'll just kind of passive aggressively say it in my group. <laughs> no, <not. laughs> but uh, but I'll but I'll use that as direct. Uh, example. So I'll, I'll find mistakes that people are making. It could be a lot of it comes down to guys trying to sell to everybody. Even even in the lawn care business, it's guys trying to sell to everybody. Guys that are desperate for work. Guys that are focused more on their income than they are on the value they're providing. These are the biggest mistakes. And so in every industry. To, in a, yeah, it, it, anywhere you go, it's easy. Yep. Yeah, it's it's easy to be a guy who just just I don't know. Ask ask people questions about what they're concerned about and then help alleviate them. Offer more than just technical tri trips or tricks, you know, offer maybe um, just motivation and like, I, I, it's, hard, it's hard to say, it's super, it's super woo science, it's super lovey-dovey or uh, It's working. Or whatever. But it works, I mean, but, it's, but yeah, it's, it's it's a, it's a chicken and an egg question, kind of. Which one, like, do I do it because it's working, or am I doing it because it's just it feels like it's the right way to do it? Both. Uh, yeah, both. Yeah, but I guess you know one of the biggest things for me has been uh, well, I, like I just did a twenty thousand kilometer trip uh, around the states um, in the last year with my girlfriend, and we did it out of our car. Um, and we airbnb our places while we were gone, which pretty much covered our fuel expense. And so it almost cost nothing. So just, I've been, I've been working a lot with the um, idea of minimalism also. And so the more that, the, or the less that I'm concerned with money and the more that I'm concerned with experience, it seems to really add fuel to this whole fire. So when, I, when people are buying from me, I feel like they're buying from me because they know that I care about their businesses and that I want to help them grow in a way that they can offer great employment to their staff and and that's what i get out of it and that's that's i feel as if i if i keep focusing on that being my main payout the money just follows like of course there's economics to it and i have to cover expenses and i have to I have to I, I i definitely have an aspiration to make money but it's not the number one goal and, and as soon as i made it like a second or third goal after first showing that i care about people Second, not being desperate. So by not being desperate, I mean I'm happy to walk away from a deal with a, with the client. If if I have somebody coming to me, um, and it's all about money, you know, like if they don't care about me, then it's not going to work. If 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 if, we're, if we can't relate, no fit. Um, this might not be the best way to build a scalable business to a billion dollars. I don't think Apple cares as, cares quite the same way I'm thinking of these things. Well, they but, care about their why, right? I mean, this is the whole cynic thing, right? Like, it, it's their yeah. why first, then their what, then their how, as opposed to the other way around. So, I, I think yeah. Steve Jobs <laughs> cared about like what he cared about fanatically, um, right? So, I, I don't know. Maybe it is the way to build a billion dollar business. Yeah. All right. No, I'm happy you point that out. Good. <laughs> nice <to know. laughs> but um. No, yeah, I don't know. Just build the business around love and respect as opposed to money. And uh, and then pick a niche, right? Because um, don't... Uh, master of... What is it? Uh, uh, jack of, jack all of all trades, master of none. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, nobody wants to hire the guy that can do it all for everybody because he probably can't. Um, so, and I... Uh, there are a million other companies in the world that offer the same thing that I offer, but they don't really know what it's like to be halfway through a lawn and have it start raining and then have the grass clumping up and then getting all stuck to the driveway. And that's like a part of your everyday life, you know? And so the fact that I can kind of sit there and share that pain with them and relate to them. And when I talk to these guys on the phone, I'm not just some marketing guy that doesn't have a clue who's right. like trying to guess which keywords. I, like I, I know, I know what these guys are doing. I know what their life is like, and and I think that having that personal connection is it, it makes everything so much more worthwhile. Uh, on that, I'm going to ask about your twenty thousand trip. I mean, so one of the reasons you were doing that, from what I understand, was to do this lawn care TV. So were you interviewing people as you were going around? 
Yes, uh, I have yet to get the videos edited. I've learned that the library has a great computer for me, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get the power I need to get those together. But um, yeah, so we, we interviewed eight different guys around the U.S. and uh, got shots of their of their whole setup and their, their shop. And what I did is I kind of mimicked uh, Tim Ferriss' interviews and how he has um, consistent questions. And the idea was not to necessarily be influencing their answers, but just to kind of offer an insight into what does a guy running a $20 million company, what are, what's, what's he thinking, what is his frame of reference, what, how, how is his head, what, what's his headspace sure. compared to um, a guy running a $100,000 company or something like that. And uh, no right or wrong answers, but just seeing the difference in perspective was super powerful for me. Um, and then actually, yeah, if I was, I, I don't think it would be that hard to become a niche expert. I mean, if you were to, if you were to join all the Facebook groups, spend an hour a day paying attention to what their concerns are, what are the, what are the posts that keep coming up? How do people talk to each other? Call, call up 10 or 20 guys in varying business sizes and, and do an interview kind of like this one maybe. And before you know it, like you know more about the niche than most people do. Um, I think that right now is kind of a, kind of a gold rush in that, in that sense um, where a lot of people are maybe concerned about automation and this where they might be losing their jobs and that might be why they're thinking about starting up a marketing business of some sort. But um, well, actually, on the trip, my girlfriend, uh, I told her I was going to be working. It wasn't, it wasn't just like, <laughs> I wasn't just not working for three months. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was finally location independent for the first time in my life uh, after having been tied to this, this business in Ottawa. So, um, so I was working for my laptop. But so I, I said, if you want, I can coach you to build a business of your own. So that way you have something to do while I'm working. Okay. And so she worked as kind of a physiotherapist assistant in the U.S. It's called um, uh, instead of it's physical therapy, I think. Um, and so what we did is we made her a niche expert in the world, probably for exercise rehab copywriting. Okay. Um, okay. Because she knew how to, she did is not a physiotherapist. She doesn't have the schooling. She she has a, an undergraduate degree. Sure. Um, but she had about three or four years in basically being a personal trainer for, for exercise therapy. Sure. And so we looked at, and she enjoyed writing. So those two went well together. Um, so we, so rather than going on Upwork and applying to all the writing jobs, all, she only applied to the physical therapy writing jobs. Sure. And now she has a huge portfolio of physical therapy writing jobs, and she knows she can close one in ten that she applies to. And, and they'll so, pay a premium because they want that particular expertise. Right. So now she's making twice what she makes at her at the physical therapy job. Uh, and she's dropped down to she's doing two days a week with them and uh, soon to be one day a week. And she's on her own schedule. She's making twice the amount of money well, per, per hour. Sure. Um, sure. And she's in control. So, I mean you'd think it would be almost impossible to get into writing about personal training. You know, it's like, because how many guys are there? How many, how many Instagram personal trainers are there? Like a million maybe. Um, <laughs> and how many of them make no money at all? Like all of them. Uh, <laughs> and how many of them have been doing it for years and years? Maybe a few, but she, she picked this up in about three months. Uh, right. So yeah, the power of the niche, like, it, it's, it's, it, it's it all comes back to that. It's easy to become an expert in a small pond. Right. Um, yeah. So looking back now on your journey, so you, you've been in marketing how long? Two, three years? Um, well, marketing, marketing, life. marketing, not not marketing your own business, but marketing, marketing for other people's businesses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. About two years, about a year, two years, a, a year of figuring it out and a year of doing it seriously. So now help some of our, uh, our audience. What are some of the things, give any two or three things that you wish you would have known earlier in the journey that you discovered through trial and error or just experience that would have been nice to know at the beginning of the journey? Well, I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> I got into the lawn care business tr hoping to be location independent and then 15 years later realized it wasn't working and then 
I, about a year later did it like, like so what, what if I had known it off the bat I think uh, rather than I, I think I would have studied the industry rather than working in it okay. <laughs> so I took the long road for sure uh, failing fast uh, it's crucial so I, I see so many guys um, just spending all their time watching YouTube videos uh, when instead maybe they should just be just try just just do it um, just do it <laughs> so, there's nobody stopping you pick up pick up your own camera make your own video do whatever you want to do you got to swing the bat fail go out and fail um, uh, like just yeah go and try and fail as fast as you can go and go and get like it was like the um the door to door sales it was it it wasn't let's try and find those three percent that are going to say yes the goal was instead let's try and get the door closed in our face 97 times <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> because we know if we get the door closed in our face 97 times we'll pick up three so there's like, a book by that title go for the no Right. Okay. Right. Right on. So go for the no. Like study the niche. Like pick pick a target. Don't sell. Don't sell everything to everybody. Pick one specific thing, one specific group of people. Spend a, a, a finite amount of time researching that group of people. So I don't know, ten hours, ten hours before before you have to fail at least once, and then maybe after you failed about five times, then you can go do another ten hours. But that's it. Um, so yeah, learn the niche, fail as fast as you can, and then yeah, learn from failing. Don't don't learn from YouTube. Don't learn. Well, yes, learn from YouTube, but you know what I mean. Like, you'll you'll learn a lot faster from actually just doing it. Um, Hundred percent like, agree. You're not gonna hit them all out of the park off the bat. So yeah, it doesn't matter how many YouTube videos you watch. It's not gonna. You're you're still not gonna hit them all out of the park. So. Okay. So how do you currently divide your time? Now that you're uh, now that you figured out your niche, you you've built an audience of what six seven hundred people in your your lawn care group, which is sounds like it's your your main attraction strategy now in terms of driving work from the group. You go to the group to add value, and then a percentage of the people in the group are going to search you out and, and buy from you. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you divide your time on a weekly basis now? What are some of the buckets that you uh, invest time into? Um, well, it's. My main buckets are um, production or, or fulfillment, so getting getting the work done for clients, okay. Okay. Uh, and then um, and then helping people is the other half. So I might call that marketing, but I don't think of it as marketing. I think like if I if I, I want to put X amount of effort each week into providing value for people and ask nothing in return. Um, so at the moment. Uh, the production side is much more uh, much more important. So I, I've been providing less value because I need to make sure that I'm look, keep looking after my clients. And so it's worked so well that I've had to back off on the on the value providing <laughs> because I, uh, I I I guess I'll be I'm saying no to people for uh, for taking on new work at this point. Um, and then from do you there, want to continue to grow, or are you happy with where you are now in terms of you have enough clients and? Now maybe you'll grow the amount of work you do with the clients you have, or are you right, still looking so, to scale up the business? I definitely want to scale the business, absolutely. But um, so from the production side, the next the, I would divide that into my two main buckets are like doing the work, but also the other half is building the system. Nice. Um, so I would say at the moment I'm probably spending more time building the system than I am doing the work. Good. Or effort, I should say. I don't know about time. Yep. Um, and so I've just been working to. Um, well, uh, the first client I, I found the first clients I had, it only allowed me to build the system so far uh, because I, it was only for them. Uh, but now that I have enough clients in different parts of the world uh, with different sized businesses, it's forced me to kind of build out the system and I, I, I took on a few that weren't within my niche and learned that they take twice as much work um, <laughs> because I have to build a whole different system for them um, it's custom and work, uh, right? so it, it's, it's not as efficient it doesn't work as well they're not as happy I can't I can't look after them as well so that that's been another uh, confirmation for me to really stick to what I'm the best at and then uh, so I can put my time into building that system Find uh, I've been working with contractors, uh, so I've been practicing um, 
writing out uh, SOPs and, and this kind of thing to, to really try and nail down what is the secret sauce uh, and what are the priorities. What are the because I I I have uh, consciously spread myself a little thin in terms of the marketing that I provide because. A lot, a lot of the businesses I work with are, are they're not well. They're around the five hundred thousand dollar mark, so they're not huge businesses, um, but they they need a lot of different marketing endeavors. You know, whether it's social, SEO, pay per click. They need multi channel for sure. They, yeah, they need multi channel. So as opposed to a bigger business that might hire a la carte for different channels. Um, so that has been a big experience for me, learning w what are the priorities of the different channels, how can I get the best return for these clients. Actually, that's that's something I've over I haven't mentioned in this interview is um, my focus on ROI. It's uh, people are I think I'm probably crazy for it, but rather than saying like oh, we did this many backlinks for you or we did whatever you're ranking for this keyword. Um, I've told my clients that I'm how I get there is kind of up to me, and I might flip flop around on what the best channel is as I test different things. Sure. So, I'm, so they've had to be okay with that, but that's also another kind of niche in a way. It's is that I've I've it's been a requirement that my clients trust me, uh, and that they don't try and micromanage me because I found that if I start kind of getting pulled off in different directions for what they're asking for, I can't give that same result. Sure. So instead what I do for them is I say, is I give them a breakdown each month of this is how much money you've spent and these are the leads that it's generated and I also I take it further, I work with them to get deep inside their numbers on their end to understand their margins and their closing rates on, on the work that I'm generating. So I have a pretty good uh, estimate, so if I know if I, I well, I, I make them track their closing rates. So if they don't, I, I probably won't be able to work with them. So I help them in, put it in a system so they can track what percentage of the leads I'm sending to them actually close. Sure. And then um, I work with them if they don't have it to have a system to figure out what their margins are and what their profit is. Mm -hmm. And then that way, at the end of the month, I can say this is what it cost you and this is the profit that you got out of it. And I do it. Um, I make sure to do it. I, I really try and look after them so they don't have to worry about it. So I do it um, accrual and cash based, so I, so so they can see like lifetime value of what they're getting. Uh, but I but it'd be easy to, to kind of trick them by only showing lifetime value. So sure. I also show the cash based. Yep. Um, so they can see like okay, your results are actually getting it's paying for itself within month two, month three kind of thing. Um, you have by, the advantage of having run this business before and understanding how the business actually has to operate from a cash flow perspective. So right. it, you're, you're serving them as they should want to be served. You're serving them as a business owner to a business owner as opposed to a marketer to a business owner where you know, very often in marketing we get focused on ROI and, and look at lifetime value and say, hey, they should like this. But at the end of the day, they still have to pay their employees. Right. Right. Yeah, so. no, that's a that's a good way to word it. What you're saying, and and it was it was a big concern of mine too coming into it because I didn't. <laughs> I'm a horrible employee. I've never had a job. <laughs> I'm, I I worked. Uh, I was a ski instructor, and I worked at a grocery store for a couple of years when I was a kid, and that's it. And I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> um, so that's it's definitely had I, like the first few phone calls with uh, with prospects is kind of like, are you cool with this? Because if you're not cool with this, I'm probably not going to be able to make you happy. Yeah. Uh, but that's again another niche, right? So the ones that I have, like if if I, uh, when I first started, uh, if I was more, I don't know, if I was more desperate than I am now, I would have been more willing to to bend to these to these requirements, to these to to what they to what they ask. Yep. And like I had one client, we started off doing mowing, uh, and then he wanted uh, to build his duct cleaning site up, so we moved to that within a month, and then we popped to another one within a month, and then we had. Spent a bunch of money and didn't have any ROI because we had five projects that were just half started. Right. So that's where I realized, no, 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 no. Like this has to. We, we even if your business is ten times bigger than mine, we need to be kind of on equal footing here because you need to trust me as the marketing guy to figure it out for you, as opposed to just I don't want to just sell ten social posts per month. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it might be it might be more scalable, um, and that's where my system is going to really. Uh, it's going to be really important if I want to be able to scale this business. 
Sure. Uh, I'll have to have a, a very strong system to handle the complexity of of actually providing a return as opposed to just a list of activities. Right. Um, but I, but that's again that idea of looking after your clientele as opposed to just working for them. Awesome. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a, a Tim Ferriss question. So uh, <laughs> what's what's something you spent a hundred bucks on in the last month that you're enjoying? Oh man, a hundred bucks on in the last month that I'm enjoying. Oh, floats, isolation tanks. Um, what's, I have no idea what that <laughs> is. So um, it's it, so it's about it's it's ninety minutes uh, and it costs fifty bucks. Okay. And it's a tank that is. Fill, it's, it has about a foot of water in the bottom of it. it it's kind of like a giant coffin, almost, okay. uh, with about a foot of water in the bottom and 800 pounds of Epsom salts. Okay. Uh, so you're virtually weightless. You can just lie on top of the water, basically. Okay. And it's uh, lightproof and soundproof. So wow. you so you get into this tank and uh, the the ones I use are kind of fancy. They they have light that fades out and music that kind of calms you down because it's a little terrifying the first time. Sure. Um, but you're just entering the space of your head. There there are no external uh, influences to throw you off. So it's like a it's like a forced meditation on steroids. And how long do you go for? Uh, normally it's 60 minutes, but I like 90 minutes. Do, um, do you work your way up to that or do people start at 60 minutes? I would start at six. Well, you can jump out anytime you want if you don't like it. Uh, okay. You're not locked in there. Oh, that's good. But, um, but um, yeah, I would start with 60. I, I would probably, I don't know, I've been meditating for a while um, and that helped for sure. Uh, it's not it's not immediately comfortable. It, it, it does take a little bit of getting used to. Your first float won't be anywhere nearly as interesting as your sixth or seventh. Okay. But it's just, um, it's just this place where you can, you can sort through your thoughts sure. and, and I find you'll have, there's the thought that like comes into your head and it drives you nuts and you think about it for a little bit. And then there's another thought that comes in and takes it over. And then there's another thought that takes it over. But after about a half an hour being in there, this cycle of thoughts, some of them stop coming back because you sure. kind of like, I'm done with that one for now. And then eventually you, you boil it down to like these one or two thoughts and then you kind of figure them out. I don't know. There's nothing else to do. Yeah. Uh, you're just in your head. There's nothing to look at. There's nothing to listen to. You're just in your head. Um, it's, uh, uh, if I find now when I'm floating that um, I, I can't even tell which way is up. So uh, often it feels like I'm stand, like I'm floating vertically when really I'm on my back. Sure. Um, but yeah, no. So And then it gets really interesting once you've sorted through your, once you've, it's like, it's like you're defragging your mind. Yep. Right, so you, you defrag your mind, and it's all clear, yep. uh, and then and then you're just there in like pure creativity. So some people say that they have uh, like hallucinations, or they go on kind of a trip, or for for me lately though, um, I haven't been meditating enough, so I can go the whole ninety minutes and just be bouncing from thought to thought. But usually I can come out of it with like a short, concise to do list, and. Uh, it help, I, I, I suffer from like a bit of a, a lockup where if I have too many different ideas going on all at the same time, just everything just kind of freezes. Sure. Uh, that'll unstick that almost every time. So interesting so, floats. Yeah. I'll check but, that yeah. out. So it's uh, some people call them float tanks or uh, sensory deprivation tank is float another. Tanks. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and joining us here, guys. If you want to check Chris out, you can check him out at chrispenny101.com. Find him online. He's on Facebook for sure. Um, he's quick to respond, and I reached out to him, and he was quick to get back. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. If you guys got something from this video, definitely hit the subscribe button. Leave a comment below. We'll make sure we'll engage with you here on the channel. And if you got something, give us a thumbs up. Really appreciate it. Chris, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks, Dan. It was fun. Awesome.